Hello, everyone. I am Vicky Murillo, the director of the ILAS, which is the Institute of Latin American Studies at Columbia University. Hola, soy Vicky Murillo, la directora del Instituto de Estudios Latinoamericanos de la Universidad de Columbia. Este evento tiene traducción simultánea, así que pueden elegir en el globito que dice interpretación abajo o si usan un teléfono marcando los tres puntitos. Uh, this event has simultaneous translation from English to Spanish, and you can select the language pressing on interpretation at the bottom of the screen or the three points uh, uh, if you are using a telephone. Um, I want to, to welcome all of you to this seminar co-sponsored by the Institute of Latin American Studies and the Institute for Global Politics at the School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, I invite everyone to follow both the ILAS and the IGP in social media, and we will provide information in the chat for our newsletter. Again, de nuevo, si quieren escucharlo en español, aprieten donde dice interpretation, el, el globo terráqueo. Um, Ecuador has been recently on the news everywhere, not just in Ecuador, due to the security situation ranging from the killing of a presidential candidate a few months ago to the takeover of prisons and a TV channel by criminal groups last month uh, and the establishment of the state of siege. This situation, this security situation is important both for Ecuador, which suffers the brunt of the consequences, but also for the rest of the region, which is the region with the highest homicide rates in the world and where security has become a crucial challenge. Today, we have the pleasure of having an extraordinary panel to discuss, discuss the security crisis in Ecuador, its origins and its implications. So let me introduce the panelists to you. We have Lucia Dahmer, who's a professor of international relations at the Universidad de Santiago de Chile and an expert on public security, criminal organizations and criminal justice reform. She just published Making Police Reform Matter in Latin America, along with Mary Malone and Orlando Perez. And among her many positions, she was chief of advisors of President Boric and a member of the UN Secretary General Advisory Board on disarmament matters. We also have Renato Rivera, who's a coordinator of the Equatorian Observa Observatory on Organized Crime, Crime of the Pan Americas Development Foundation. He's an expert on organized crime and political economy, and he teaches international security and geopolitics at the Universidad de las Americas. And finally, we have our moderator, our own Eduardo Moncada, who's an associate professor of political science at Barnard College, an expert on crime and violence in Latin America, and his most recent book is Resisting Extortion, Victims, Criminals, and States in Latin America. Thank you to the three of you for agreeing to participate and coordinate this event. Uh, remember, si quieren en español, donde dice interpretation, al, abajo, and I let you, I leave you now. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky, and thank you again to the Institute of Latin American Studies and to the Institute for Global Politics at Columbia University for bringing us together. Um, as Vicky noted, uh, Ecuador today is experiencing levels and forms of criminal violence unprecedented in the country's modern history, uh, and it's very different than it was just a few years ago. Ecuador was long seen as an island of peace in a part of Latin America where crime and violence were and remain major issues, uh, driven partly by the illicit drug trade. But what we see today in Ecuador, unfortunately, uh, now resembles what we've seen and, and what we continue to see in parts of Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, among others. So the questions that bring us together today are, are plentiful. What explains the sudden increase in crime and violence in Ecuador? What are the historical, political, socioeconomic roots of this new reality? How effective will the new government's response be? And what are the implications of what we're seeing in Ecuador for the politics of security and crime in the broader Latin American region? We are very fortunate today to have two leading experts to help us think through these very complex questions and very important questions. So I'll take a pause now and allow turn it over to uh, Renato first. Well, thank you, Eduardo and Nilas, for the opportunity to share how external and internal factors have influenced the evolution of violence in Ecuador and the insertion of its organized crime into what I call the global economy of, of or criminal uh, or organized crime. During this time, I'll focus my intervention on explaining uh, why the three key events, the Colombian peace agreement, the loss of power of the Sinaloa cartel, 
and the COVID pandemic all modified Ecuador's status as one of the safest countries in the region, turning into the most violent instead in 2023. These events help explain why by the end of this year, Ecuador had the highest level of criminality. Uh, first, the external factors that drove Ecuador to become relevant for transnational criminal organizations are connected to the 2016 Colombian peace agreement between the FARC and the Colombian government. On the southern border, border of Colombia, um, new breakaway groups decentralized global cocaine trafficking by inserting new buyers such as the Jalisco Nueva Generación Cartel of Mexico and the Albanian mafias. Um, due to an increasing cocaine production in, in southern border, Ecuador accelerated its importance as a platform for cocaine logistics in transnational organized crime. Um, second, the detention and extradition of El Chapo to, to the U.S. was seen as an opportunity for the Jalisco cartel to gain increased power and access to the cocaine business in southern Colombia and therefore uh, in Ecuador. Since 2018, uh, the organization moved more cocaine through Ecuador by subcontracting Ecuadorian gangs such as Los Choneros and uh, the Lagartos and Los Lobos, who are very relevant nowadays, to move Jalisco's cocaine through Ecuadorian ports in, in Central America, for example, Costa Rica. Third, uh, the COVID pandemic had a profound impact on the global cocaine trade. Uh, since 80% of licit trade moves by sea, uh, criminal organizations also use this means of tra transportation to move large amounts of cocaine all around the globe. Um, due to the container crisis in 2020 and 2021, of course, transnational organized crime couldn't export the same amount of cocaine from the production enclaves in, in Colombia to the consumer markets. During the pandemic in, this, in these two years, Ecuador's coastal provinces serve as a cocaine warehouse, if you, if you, if you want, for transnational criminal organizations. Since international ports were closed, Ecuadorian, Ecuadorian criminal organizations serve as a, as a sort of a cocaine keepers, if you will. This only gave more power of negotiation and legitimacy to Ecuadorian gangs to sell cocaine to foreign criminal organizations, uh, making Ecuador a profitable market to export cocaine through global consumers. On the other hand, the internal factors that propelled Ecuador into the global economy of organized crime and unprecedented level, uh, violence level are um, threefold. Uh, one, a uh, dollar's economy as a decent um, road infrastructure in Ecuador that facilitates the transportation of cocaine from Colombia to um, the ports. But also a third point that I, that I see very relevant is uh, an inefficient control of law enforcement institutions to prosecute organized crime activities in Ecuador. This is very important. In terms of the criminal organization's landscape, um, since 2020, 2010, two criminal organization networks in Ecuador have served as a logistic suppliers of transnational criminal organizations. First, the Choneros, a criminal gang from the port city of Manta, which is in, in the central Ecuador, if you, if you will, and the logistic structure created by a former military intelligence officer, Telmo Castro. Both are subcontracted by Colombian and Mexican mafias during these years. From 2010 to 2020, a strategic alliance between the Sinaloa cartel and the Choneros, led by the former leader of the Choneros, Rasquiña, created a monopoly of drug traffic in, in Ecuador run from the prisons. That's why prisons are so relevant in Ecuador and the, and the violence among it. Based on the federal and franchise model, if you will, of the Choneros, the organization grouped small gangs such as Los Tiguerones, Los Lobos, the Chone Killers, and a fraction of the Latin Kings into, the single, into a single criminal organization, all commanded from prison by Rasquiña and Sinaloa from Mexico. The criminal business model of Los Choneros led to a systematic reduction of violence to ensure success into these criminal markets. In addition, during these 10 years, Ecuadorian state made important efforts to reduce criminality, including through profound police reforms and a higher investment in development programs focused mainly on the coastal provinces of Ecuador. 
As a result, from 2011 to 2027, Ecuador reduced its levels of violence significantly, um, becoming the second safest countries in the region by the end of, of 2027. In the meantime, the criminal governance models of Los Choneros and the strategic importance of Ecuador for drug trafficking captured the attention uh, of at least five criminal, five transnational criminal organizations. The Balkan mafias, uh, especially Albanians, the Sinaloa cartel, the cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación, Colombian paramilitary groups, and the dissidencias of las FARC. The interest of foreign criminal organization, which coincides with the Colombian peace agreement and the loss of power of the Sinaloa cartel, put the Choneros empire in danger. And uh, of course, the unprecedented violence broke up. In 2018, the first prison massacres evidenced the loss of power and fragmentations within the Choneros. These eventually lead uh, at least 500 murders inside Ecuadorian prison complexes between 2018 and 20 to 2023. This fragmentation of the loss of power of the Choneros ended in December 2020 with the murder of Rasquiña, the, the Choneros jefe, the Choneros commander. This year, the Ecuadorian government launched a fierce war against criminal organizations, leading to new alliances and the territorial control disputes among them. On the other hand, um, this uh, fragmentation, if you will, of Los Choneros, uh, putting one side the Los Lobos, Tiguerones, Chonequilers, and Lagarto into an alliance called Nueva Generación, linked and financed with the Jalisco Cartel of, of Mexico. On the other hand, the Choneros maintain its structure, but divided into two leaders, Fito on one hand and Junior, Junior Roldan on the other. This panorama had a profound impact on violence, especially in city ports like, Guaya like Guayaquil, where 35% of Ecuador's homicide rates are committed nowadays. The war between criminal organizations in Ecuador has amplified their activities to extortion, illegal mining, spread spreading violence into new cities that didn't have this level of violence, such as Ibarra, for example, which is a, a city in, in La Sierra in, in the Andes. Ecuador is so important to international uh, drug cartels nowadays that 47% of, of the cocaine produced in Colombia concentrates on the Ecuadorian-Colombian border. This means that at least 500 tons of cocaine are sent from Ecuador to consumption markets like the US and Europe. But what does it mean for other countries in the region, right? Sadly, the Ecuadorian case, uh, for, for me, my experience, is a unique example for those who study organized crime. The absence of, the absence of, of violence between 10, 2010 and 2018 in an, in an strategic country for drug trafficking like Ecuador does not mean that illicit markets are not exploiting and creating more profitable opportunities for criminal organizations, right? In this context, violence could quickly escalate when organized crime is fragmented, like the Choneros example, due to the importance to these organizations of gaining more power to control drug trafficking networks. This scenario caused the murder rate in Ecuador to go from 5.7 per 100,000 uh, habitants in 2017 to 45.6 in 2023, making Ecuador the most violent country in the region. So that's, I think it's my quick explanation of what is actually happening in Ecuador from a strategic point of view. And I want to thank you all for your time. Thank you, Renato. That was a, an amazing panorama of what's been happening and some of the driving factors here to explain what's been happening in, in Ecuador as well. I'm sure we have lots of questions for you as the talk progresses today. For now, let's turn it over to Lucia. Lucia, please. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Renato. It's been very interesting to listen to you. Um, and I'm going to share my screen because there are so many lessons on this, you know, security crisis um, in Ecuador. So I just rather uh, keep on some of the issues that I think are more important. Uh, and Renato mentioned some of them. So um, I'm going to concentrate on five lessons from the, the Equatorian situation now into the Latin American realm. So the first one is that, um, and, and as Renato mentioned, 
a changes and transformation in the regional context in either politics or security dynamics play an important role in domestic context. And this is something that we didn't actually uh, took a look uh, in a more detailed way previously. So for instance, the Plan Colombia clearly altered the trafficking routes. They involve uh, actors in the narcotics trade. Also, as Renato mentioned, the peace agreement with the FARC in Colombia reshaped incentives, um, the structures, and the, redefined the actors and the narco trafficking um, uh, market. Also, the Merida initiative had an impact on regional and global drug market, creating opportunities for new actors and potential conflicts. So the main lesson here is that, of course, if something is being organized in Ecuador, now either Peru or other countries, small and big in Latin America, have to take care of what the, the overflow of the results of that intervention will have. Because the problem is that we are not really fixing the market. We are trying to make or organize some policies, but the market continues to be there. Uh, and this is something you know that is uh, really important, not only for Latin American politics, but also for the idea that the U.S. has to redefine, reshape, and revisit the drug on board uh, initiative. Um, and and that's just the first lesson. The second lesson uh, is that illegal markets are, are characterized now by being uh, flexible very opportunistic and they have a, a, a big uh, capacity of entrepreneurship so of course as uh, renato mentioned you know guayaquil assumes the role of uh, previously held by buenaventura many organizations evolve into a very interconnected networks with low levels of proximity uh, and this is something very different from the idea of Pablo Escobar or the idea of the Chapo, you know, even though there are many branches, uh, franchises, or even, you know, copycats uh, that, you know, many people say that they are part of the Sinaloa cartel or the Jalisco Nueva Generación cartel. But let me tell you, I really need to see that, you know, that uh, membership in some place because um, we have found in many other countries, the relatively uh, low level violent countries, that criminals uh, sometimes, you know, relate to these huge organizations in order to get uh, recognition or in order to get some security even in jail. So if you say that you're part of the Tren de Aragua, you're going to be treated in a different way that, you know, being part of my mom and pop uh, regular uh, cartel in my neighborhood. So, uh, but those are presents, uh, uh, present everywhere. Uh, and also the drug market has diversified. It's, it's cocaine, but we have many other uh, drugs. And there is an increasing and changing uh, routes of the arms trafficking, all the arms that went from Peru into Colombia for the for the former um, guerrilla movement in Colombia are now, at, um, at least there is evidence that they are now in Ecuador. There's lots of, you know, different routes for the armed trafficking in that part of the of Latin America. And as uh, Eduardo knows very well, extortion has become the main tool for many of those, you know, branches, franchises and imitation, uh, local and regional gangs, uh, for them to get income. And I would, um, in some countries there is kidnapping and I would um, put my, my alert on the possibility of seeing more kidnappings in Latin America in the following you know, years. Also the dollarization have provided in Ecuador an opportunity, a huge opportunity for money laundering and the legal markets you know, took uh, advantage of that. And as uh, Renato mentioned, the overproduction of cocaine during COVID-19 uh, pandemia, a pandemic uh, served as a foundation of a market shift. There's, there is a third lesson that is really important nowadays that we are discussing the, the success of the Bukele uh, movement on the Bukele you know, dream uh, in Latin America. Well, in prison is not the solution for the problem of crime or, or, or illegal markets. Um, it can be a, 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 a partial solution for the problem of crime, but it will not be uh, not even, you know, a partial solution for the problem of illegal markets such as drug trafficking, you know, and others. So 
Uh, what we have seen in, in Ecuador is, an, uh, is the fact that incarceration fa facilitates criminal organization, that mass uh, preventive detention foster criminal contagion, and that the abandonment of the system of strengthening organizations and the capacity of criminal actors from within the, the, the system. So this is nothing really new. We know that from the PCC in Brazil, we know that from almost everywhere, because one of the common problems that we're facing in Latin America is the co completely collapse of the, of the imprisonment and the jail system in general. So for me, it's not really a surprise that criminal organizations are governing crime from the jails uh, in, instead of being outside on the public space because jails have become place, safe places for them. And that uh, that leave us to the fourth um, lesson and uh, that the weak institutions and increasing corruptions, of course, are key factors in criminal, in the criminal situation that we have now in Latin America and in Ecuador. We always say that, but you know, in the Ecuadorian case is very evident uh, not only the state has forsaken social policies, and we have lots and you know of kids and youngsters who are not studying, who are not getting any jobs. We have over fifty percent of the population working on the informal sector, a sector that it's you know it's really close to the illegal sector. I'm not you know uh, overemphasizing the role of the informal sector as all of them being illegal, but there is you know a blur the divide between these two. So um, uh, that is a fertile ground for illegal actions and you know criminal organizations to flourish. And let me tell you, uh, states of emergency have proved ineffective either in Ecuador. President Lasso um, uh, declared twenty times, uh, you know, a state of emergency due to uh, imprisonment or, or jail crisis. And of course, you know, that hasn't really changed anything. There has uh, escalated violence in some place. And now we have this declaration of internal war. My sense is that it can, you know, may follow the similar path. As soon as the whole, the whole forces of the criminal market start to, you know, make some, to find some equilibrium, I'm not really sure this will, you know, change or either impact the, the, mar the legal market. And of course, there is a permanent backdrop of, you know, of the ongoing economic crisis that foster illegality. So uh, the, the fifth and last lesson that I think is important for us to, to discuss uh, is the role of politics. You know, security is not an issue. And I hope that, you know, many students, you know, listening to us now, from the policy and sociology and criminology areas and those interested in Latin America realize that you know security is a political issue it's really you know it's, it's an issue that has a lot to do with you know institutional building democratization it has a lot to do with inequalities in Latin America I'm not saying that in, 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 other, in other areas of the world there, there is no uh, criminal markets or criminal or criminality in general, but in our in our space of the world, um, we have to take into consideration the complete crisis of political parties, uh, the complete crisis of representation, the lack of legitimacy of political discussions. And in that context, of course, security has become unfortunately not an uh, not a clear area for political discussion and that has a lot to do with you know the permanence of failure of everything that has been trying to implement it um besides you know the the limited uh, success that we have had in the last 20 or 30 years uh, we have lots uh, of political corruption that is widely acknowledged not only you know in Ecuador but everywhere not only for elected officials, but also in uh, other sectors of the state, especially the justice system. So, you know, there is a greater sense of impunity also. It's not only sense of fear that drives Latin Americans, but also there is a sense of impunity, uh, you know, that is present everywhere in Latin American debates. And 
we have already in Ecuador one presidential candidate being killed. Uh, also, you know, uh, a former uh, journalist, uh, among many other journalists who have been, you know, killed. So my sense is that in the year 2024, we will um, not not we will have um, an important election because you know uh, President Novoa uh, has to finish his term, and undoubtedly. I think the focus of the whole discussion in Ecuador will be security. And my sense is that violence will quickly move to the political arena. And unfortunately, we will be able to see some escalation you know, of violence in that area. So let me finish with two ideas for Q&A. Uh, we always call uh, Ecuador an island of peace. And Eduardo mentioned that. I remember it was an island because it was, you know, in between Peru and Colombia who were not, you know, it was the, they were the productors of cocaine. The problem is, is not that we don't have the island, we don't have peace. Um, so, you know, it's not like Peru and Colombia increased so, so much that now Ecuador is really the worst off. Uh, in fact, my sense is that, you know, everyone, um, is kind of getting in a very turbulent time, and and that lock and that uh, links to the final comment that um, be careful that uh, to to think that when you don't have a higher rate of homicides, that means that there is no illegal markets. Uh, that means that there is no crisis. Uh, so I know that for, you know, for media and for, you know, the whole social networks and so on and so forth, uh, we always take a look at the the problems when you have, you know, massacres on places or things like that. But just just be careful because my sense is that we are going into a phase in Latin America in which the presence of illegal markets will become uh, the norm rather than, you know, the specific case. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia, for that wonderful overview and a very sobering uh, overview as well about what to expect in different parts of Latin America and in Ecuador as well. Um, so just as a reminder, please put your questions in the chat. Um, and I see that we already have several questions here. Um, if I could, before I turn in the to the Q&A, sorry, in the, Eduardo, in the Q&A. No worries, of course, in the Q&A. Um, and if I could actually just uh, kind of build off of, to open us up first, um, build off of this last point that Lucia made, which I think is quite important, um, where oftentimes we make the assumption that low levels of violence means no illicit markets are operating or there's no sort of uh, criminality present. Um, and this kind of connects to Renato's um, excellent point as well and observation that um, Ecuador did come from this period of time when you have some of the lowest levels of homicide rates in, in the country's history. And, and this actually aligns with one of the questions in the chat, uh, which asks, why did the period of no violence, or shall we say low violence, perfectly overlap with President Correa's presidency? Do you think his presidency and his politics to some degree may have shaped or influenced the current crisis? Um, and so I, I'd like to open up kind of thinking about this idea that limited violence or low violence may not necessarily mean that there's no criminality, but what does it mean for the types of politics that were instituted during this period of time? Thinking particularly about Correa's presidency when you also had gang legalization, uh, which was sort of novel in the region as well. So oh, I'd like to open it up there. Maybe Renato, you'd like to take a stab at it first? Yes, of course. Um, for my point of view, the low rates of violence has to do with uh, alliances between criminal organizations in, a, in an environment where the state, uh, the institutions are weak. And why I say this, um, that's why I explain the fragmentations of the Choneros as a, as a pit point, if you want, uh, for, for violence in Ecuador. Institutions are weak. The justice system institutions do not work in Ecuador. For example, I was thinking when Lucia was talking about uh, money laundering, um, and in Ecuador, these these the response of the justice system regarding uh, money laundering are, are very very, uh, I'll say, um, not working very well. If you want, why? For example, I was I was thinking in Ecuador you have one conviction per year for money laundering in a country that is extremely relevant for drug trafficking activities. So in terms of 
what the state or the institutions are doing in terms of violence and uh, response to organized crime, you, did, you do not see a uh, significant change. That's why I think during the Correa period, there was a strong alliance among the choneros that actually helped to reduce violence. Of course, you have a, a lot of, uh, of policies surrounded the police and the militaries that work. But from my point of view in this, uh, I will say puzzle between weak institutions and the strong uh, alliance between criminal organizations, that's why an explanation of a, of a violence uh, reduction rate in Ecuador. Right. So in a way, paradoxically telling us that strong criminal organizations that coordinate with each other are able to keep violence low and sort of still coordinate these illicit markets at the same time. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, and then I see several questions in the chat here. Uh, Lucia, I think there was one that kind of aligns with a little bit with what you were talking about, which I, really struck me, which was this point about what the United States role is here as well. Um, there's been discussions I just saw in the news about sort of massive amounts of foreign aid for Ecuador from the United States to tackle this issue. Uh, some people calling it the new Plan Colombia, but a plan for Ecuador instead. Um, and there's questions in the chat that get at some of these issues of U.S.-Ecuadorian relations in this context. For example, uh, Cristina Cavaleri asks, I know that Ecuadorian migration to the United States has also increased exponentially, some of it likely driven by crime and violence. How do you think that might affect U.S.-Ecuador relations? Could you talk to us a little bit about sort of what you see as the state of U.S.-Ecuador relations around the security issue right now and thinking as well about this migration issue? Sure. Well... The, the main problem here for me um, is that the, we are very relevant for the U.S. You know, internal discussion. We as Latin Americans, not not only Ecuadorians, um, we are not in the center of any important discussions uh, happening in D.C. right now. Uh, for you know, for the next presidential election, of course, uh, drugs are important, but the but the U.S. is centered around fentanyl right now, rather than other you know, uh, uh, rather than other drugs. And in that in that area, what it's uh, what is shame is that we haven't learned many lessons from the Plan Merida, Plan Colombia, you know, initiatives. So if if the U.S. thinks that in order to help Ecuador, the solution is to you know I don't know to build two or three more military bases and change the constitution to allow Ecuadorians to have military bases or military U.S. military presence, well you know we we can do it, but that is not going to work. I mean we will have fire in Bolivia, or we are going to have fire in Peru, and the whole thing will you know move around. So. Of course, the U.S. has to change some of its policies, uh, policies, specifically, I think, linked to the social economic uh, development of Ecuador. I mean, if you have a country that in which 50 percent of people are in the informal market, in which, you know, the COVID-19 left many, many Equatorians in poverty, uh, that either the health system or the educational system are really not working. I mean, it's no wonder that uh, drug trafficking now, illegal mining tomorrow, you know, armed trafficking in, in a couple of weeks will flourish because, you know, uh, the, the, the problems are really, uh, are really tough. So I would uh, rather see the U.S. discussing those issues instead of just focusing on police help. Uh, but of course, now that we are in the emergency mode, uh, we will see some of the you know international cooperation and multilateral organizations arriving in Ecuador trying to figure out what to do. Um, I think that this is a uh, unfortunately not in the U.S. because I cannot imagine the Trump Biden discussion on ending the war on drugs, you know. But I think that in Latin America, this is a good moment to discuss what are we going to do with that illegal market. And other markets, such as you know, illegal mining, we all know where the illegal gold goes. So what are we going to do with that? Um, because it's infected Latin America with lots of you know homicides and other and other violence. The second part of my my response has to do with some of the questions also uh, on the increasing level of migration. 
of course, and Renato perhaps knows a lot more detail on this, but uh, people are, you know, migrating from Peru in a very strong wave nowadays, not only because of post-COVID and economic crisis, but also because there are no real, real sense of future. Because if you live in a life and a land of impunity and a land of fear, of course, you will try to figure, you know, to find a new place for you and your family. And my sense is that this second wave of the Equatorian movement, uh, that the first one was around 2000 for economic, uh, for economic problems, will get stronger. It's not going to, you know, um, disappear. And in that area also, perhaps, uh, there has to be some multilateral uh, conversation. So... This is not going to be solved by the U.S. Ecuador meeting. We have to have a Latin American, U.S., you know, Canada conversation, a more integral part of, um, you know, not, not only in terms of drugs, but in terms of the whole illegal system. I, it is a shame what Renato just said. It's not, you know, a, a number. If you have one case of money laundering in Ecuador, I mean... You know, the rest is just very much expected. Great. Uh, Renato, could you also perhaps weigh in a little bit on this? I'm wondering to complement Lucia's perspective here. I mean, what are you seeing and observing and thinking from the from within Ecuador? How is the government sort of viewing this in terms of the geopolitics of the issue of security and its relationship with countries like the United States and neighboring countries as well? Um. You have to take a look of what's happening in Ecuador in terms of geopolitics. China has become a relevant actor for Ecuador in the last few years in terms of technological um, assistance, in terms of trade. Ecuador is a relevant trade uh, partner with China nowadays. So in that sense, the U.S. is a strategic actor for the war against drugs. So in that regard, Actually, what is the U.S. has been doing in the last month or the last, I think, two years is uh, putting more pressure to the government to receive more uh, military assistance, but also to put more pressure for China. This, that's part of the geopolitical, uh, I'll say, interest of the U.S. to control the influence of, of China in not only in Ecuador, in, but in the region in general. So in that sense, Ecuador is also a part of this uh, geopolitical uh, uh, role play, if you want, of, of the U.S. and the and the, the the hegemonic aspect of China and the and the U.S. But I I was also thinking in terms of migration. The, the question of migration is really is really relevant. And if you if you look what is happening in Ecuador, actually the migration waves nowadays respond to insecurity. The first migration wave uh, from Ecuadorians to Europe and the U.S. in the 2000s responded, responded to, to the economic crisis. Nowadays, it's, it's a mix of both, but security is really important or insecurity for, for migration. Actually, uh, if you look at the people who are crossing the Darien, um, the Darien Gap in between Panama and Colombia, Ecuadors are the second citizen now crossing the, the Darien. And if you ask the people, why are they migrating? They ask because of insecurity and mainly because of extortions, uh, vacunas it's called in, in Ecuador. The um, businesses, the local businesses could not hold any or, or hold what the criminal organizations nowadays are doing. They actually have a sort of, um, of a tax, if you want, for the war between them. And that is very costly for, for businesses. So the people are closing their businesses and they migrate illegally to the U.S. due to these war against, uh, between the criminal organizations. So the context has changed a lot, but has a lot of influence to the, to the U.S. Great. And then I want to kind of center us a little bit on the politics or take Lucia's invitation for us to think about this as a political issue really seriously, because I think it's a hugely important point. Um, and there's several questions in the chat that sort of get at this. Uh, for example, there's questions about mano dura policies in other countries that seem to be influencing what we're seeing in parts of Latin America, perhaps also Ecuador, for example, in El Salvador, where there will be elections on Sunday as well. Uh, with the Bukele model that uh, Lucia mentioned, um, and others asking about 
Ecuadorian voters or Ecuadorian citizens having to perhaps make a trade, a trade-off between democracy and security. So I'm wondering if you could both, I'd like to invite both of you to kind of think, help us think through this issue of if this is indeed a deeply political issue, what do we see as sort of the future moving forward here in Ecuador, but also in other Latin American countries, Peru and others, uh, in terms of this kind of new debate that's emerged about the trade-off between democracy on the one hand and security on the other hand? Um, is this a question that is at the forefront of voters' minds? Um, is this how politicians are thinking about it as well? Um, and what does that imply for sort of the future of democratic institutions in the region? So maybe, Lucia, if you want to take a stab at it first. Yeah, well, I'm not really optimistic, so I don't know <laughs> if my answer is going to be, you know, putting everything on the dark moment. But my sense is that we are not going to have a debate. We are going to go for punitive populism throughout Latin America, either left wing or right wing governments. We are going to see an increasing uh, presence of politicians selling uh you know, imprisonment and more punishment and, and the participation of of the armed forces in the um, in the criminal uh, control. Uh, the the whole concept of crime of crime prevention that was very important in the last fifty years in Latin America, really badly implemented. Uh, with limited resources and so on and so forth, but the whole concept has disappeared because nowadays we are not fighting in Latin America. The, the sense that, you know, the thing that changes is that now not even, I don't know, the, the safest country in Latin America is discussing the presence of crime. We are discussing the presence of international criminal organizations. Even in uh, Uruguay, even in Costa Rica or Chile, uh, we are, you know, even in a very small city in Brazil or in Peru, we are all discussing the presence of the Sinaloa cartel, of the Jalisco Nueva Generación, and the Tren de Aragua, and that, um, well, the Banyans, you know, that situation has heightened, you know, has increased so much the fear of people because everyone saw narcos, you know, everyone knows how, you know, these organizations are, you know, killer machines, not only for criminals, but for everyone. So my sense is that the Bukele um, narrative is going to grow stronger, um, even though, he, of course, there are human rights violations, even though um, democratic um, values are being hindered. Um, but for a, for a, you know, medium term, that will not be a problem for many. And if you take a look at uh, Lula, pres the presidency of, pres of Lula, you know, putting military on some areas, uh, President Boric uh, calling to date for the participation of the military in specific discussions of, of crime control, uh, Petro uh, discussing, well, you know, so on and so forth, everyone, I mean, Andres Manuel López Obrador. So there is no debate. We have just one line of discussion, and this is really uh, problematic for Latin America in the near future. Great. Uh, one one quick follow up before I turn it over to Renato. Lucia, you mentioned something really right. important, which is this idea about crime prevention being done poorly or not effectively in Latin America, and that feeds into it seems to me some of this political narrative that look crime prevention or uh, going soft on crime doesn't work, right? And that we need the mano dura, we need the iron fist instead to generate security. But I'm wondering, uh, given your expertise, sort of, are there instances or examples or lessons that we did learn about how crime prevention can be done correctly or effectively in Latin America? What does it take from the political sphere, from the social sphere? Well, you know, I just wrote a piece for Nueva Sociedad on that on that specific topic, saying that we, the ones who thought that crime prevention is important, are the ones to blame for the Bukele movement now, because in most cases, that crime prevention initiatives were poorly, um, you know, poorly implemented. Um, but my sense is that um, it's very difficult to to define a country in which you know, ten to fifteen percent of youth are basically incapable of finding any jobs 
that are in the middle of, you know, three or four huge illegal markets, such as illegal mining, you know, drugs, persons, uh, migrants, um, and try to figure out, you know, specific crime control policies that will, you know, um, allow everything to, to move uh, forward. My sense is that if you take a look at what happened with uh, crime prevention, as well as, as rehabilitation from jail systems, in, in Europe or in some specific areas in the US, uh, what you see is huge investment on social areas. You know, you, you see investment on the thousands, even millions of kids who were left out of school during COVID-19 in Latin America who are not coming back to any form of education uh, that in order, you know, for those kids we need to find um, some programs that would allow them to move into out of the illegal informal market into some type of formal market. So I don't even will call it crime prevention. I would call it, you know, quality of life type of, you know, uh, democratization, uh, human rights. Uh, I don't know, uh, rule of law type of programs. But um, unfortunately, Eduardo, my my perception is that that conversation is not happening anywhere. You know, if you move throughout Latin America, what you are just listening is, you know, the fact that criminals organizations are the problem. So what would happen if tomorrow we actually deregulate the use of drugs? We will not have any problems with violence. I'm not sure about that, you know. So um, these are these are the tough questions that either politicians and and many even experts are are you know are are not uh, debating. Great, thank you, Lucia. Renato, let me turn that back to you. Then, in terms of thinking, of helping us think through the politics of this in Ecuador and beyond, from your perspective. And I should note there are questions in the chat that really are getting at this in a very kind of powerful way. People are asking about. How can you have democracy if you don't deal with uh, corruption that exists in Ecuador? When you can buy the police and the judges, how can you fight crime and corruption? So do we have to think about this as a trade-off or are there more constructive ways to think about this? And from your perspective, how is President Noboa thinking about this? How is his administration approaching this issue? Yeah, actually what I see from President Noboa is that he's uh, copying the political strategy from Bukele actually his clothes uh, the way he he um, talks to the media how to re to to he says about uh, political adversaries like correa he uses the same strategy as as bukele and i was thinking when lucia was saying about authoritarian regimes actually in ecuador um, what we are seeing is that people accept authoritarian regimes as a measure to reduce violence, actually in a, in a delegative democracy, if you want, like, like the Ecuadorian and uh, the Latin American democracies, actually people see um, like it's, a, it's good to have a, a strong leader or a military leader, if you want, to, to reduce violence. In, in Ecuador, for example, um, the armed forces are the second, I, I think it's the second institution with the highest credibility uh, after the Catholic Church. So this is why militarism is really important to reduce crime as a political strategy, because this institution is like, uh, has a good credibility among people. So that actually helps to, to move uh, the, the politic, the, I would say the security policies uh, from military uh, responses. Uh, I, I don't know if I made my point, but Actually, that is really what is happening in Ecuador. And actually, I was th also thinking, what's the response of, of, or what are the effects of having uh, more militaries on the streets? Because this is a debate really important in Latin America nowadays. And actually, there's a city in Ecuador called Duran, which is really important uh, because you, you see people hanging and and the and the link between uh, Jalisco and this and this city, uh, Jalisco Nueva Generación Cartel and this city. Actually, from uh, 2021, I think this this the city has been uh, militarized, and actually crime rates had had hadn't reduced since 2021. Actually, from the declaration um, of internal conflict, conflict in Ecuador, past two weeks ago, violence has increased. 
So actually, the, the measure of implementing more militaries in this city, the, the, the evidence in this city suggests that actually putting more militaries in on the streets does not work. And, and can I ask you actually a follow-up on that, Renato, on the sort of declaration of internal armed conflict? And this relates to several questions in the chat that ask us about what's been happening in Colombia as well with uh, President Petro's total peace program. Does it have implications as well? Um, but I'm, I'm curious as well, it's my understanding that by declaring internal armed conflict, as part of that, President Novo has also declared that these criminal organizations, I think 22 of them, as terrorist organizations. Um, and that's kind of language that we... I don't think I've heard uh, sort of in the in the spectrum until in the past when we talked about Colombia and sort of narco terrorism, or in the United States when we talked about narco terrorism when there were debates about Plan Colombia. I guess has that discussion in Ecuador about designating these groups as terrorist organizations? Can you tell us a little bit more about how that discussion has unfolded? Is it one that is contentious, or do is there general agreement on classifying these as terrorist organizations, and what are the implications of that? for things like human rights and sort of military law as well. I think we hadn't had this discussion in Ecuador and it's really relevant because I'm not sure if the 22 organizations, the criminal organizations, one, do they have a, a territorial control, for example? I'm not sure about that. This is one of the, like the pivotal points for declaring internal conflict. Uh, second, I'm not sure if the 22 organizations had a political uh, objective behind these the actions that they do. Um, for example, the, the 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 hostages that we've seen in the last two weeks in the TV channel and all these events that caused uh, uh, Ecuador to be the the central point of of international news in in the past two weeks. So uh, we haven't had this discussion. I think. For my point, my point of view suggested that what we've seen in Ecuador is a strategy or an advice of the military coup of the military forces in Ecuador to declare these organizations as terrorists, to use the the armed forces um, to combat organized crime in in Ecuador. Actually, I haven't seen um, like the terrorism or the financiation of terrorists, for example, the investigations or this link between uh, terrorism and organized crime in Ecuador is so strong uh, to suggest that they actually have uh, these uh, political um, objectives. So I think it's it's actually an advice of the of the militaries in, in Ecuador to the president to reduce violence. But uh, what I tell you before is that more and more um, militaries on the street actually does not reduce violence. What we've seen in the past two weeks is, uh, I think, uh, an extreme use of violence to especially um, teenagers. We've seen a lot of videos of, of violence and people like the military is making children to sing the Tiguerone song, a gang, a gang song of trap. So we've seen that actually this is not helping to reduce crime. What actually is going to happen is that violence uh, measures will make Ecuador most violent in, in, the, in the next uh, weeks and or months. Eduardo, if I may, I just want to follow up on Renato's. The, the whole, you know, this narrative of, become, of everyone being a terrorist um, is, a, is a measure that allows the armed forces to act with an increasing level of violence. Uh, it also, in many countries, uh, have a specific um, constitutional rights for the state to answer to terrorists instead of, you know, criminal organizations. And my sense is that as, as it happened in El Salvador, because remember that we have the super mano dura and the mano dura, and then the agreement with the Maras, you know, in 2012, um, before, and in those countries, I mean, in that country, in El Salvador, then you have, you know, uh, reconfiguration of the illegal market and the maras and the and you know as as in colombia with pablo escobar so now that we are um facing them as terrorists uh, that allows the armed forces to be perhaps more intrusive and to be more violent that will not end the illegal market because there is a constant increase in demand of drugs 
So if you have a demand of drugs, they can move out of Ecuador. Yeah, that could happen, but they will, you know, get into another context. So that is really important to see if the terrorist definition will help us uh, move forward in, in some of the areas. It, it sounds like what both of you are highlighting here in your comments as well is that, it, you know, a sort of classic issue of this is not just a supply issue, this is a demand issue. Uh, this is an issue about the different countries around the world demanding drugs and the demand from consumers there, um, and that fueling and contributing to some of the violence and the dynamics that we're seeing in Ecuador and other parts of Latin America as well, um, which again kind of highlights the need for much more dialogue around these issues between countries too, um, as we move forward. Um, in the in the last few minutes that we have, I do see just um, a few more questions that I think um, would be interesting to to have us kind of discuss. And, and perhaps most broadly, several of both of you have mentioned sort of that these aren't necessarily just drug trafficking organizations, right? These are also involved in extortion. They're involved in human smuggling. They're involved in illegal mining. Very briefly, maybe from both of you, if you could sort of help us think through a little bit, how do these connections emerge between these different illicit economies? Is this one group or several groups that control different types of illicit economies? Are they outsourcing to different criminal organizations? Sort of, I know it's a very complex issue, but perhaps in the in the last few minutes that we have to help us kind of debunk the idea that this is all about drug, only about drugs, but instead help us think about how actually very complex this is in terms of how illicit markets are in very different types of economic sectors in Latin America today. Um, I don't know who would, who'd like to take it first. Maybe maybe Lucia. Sure. Um, okay. Well. Of course, drugs are important because we produce 90% of cocaine that it's being consumed 80% in the U.S. So uh, from Colombia and Peru, we'll move all the way to the U.S. no matter what, because there is a demand and that demand brings lots and lots and lots of money to very important and not as important people throughout Latin America and perhaps in the U.S. because I don't really understand how this market works, that everything is really bad in the process of producing and moving, but when, as soon as it arrives in the US, everything kind of disappeared. Although, you know, all the consumers are, or most of the consumers are over there and um, there is impossible possibility. There is no possibility that you will not have criminal organizations over there. You know, of course you do. So um, my sense is that we have uh, organizations that are boutique type of criminal organizations. Uh, despite the Pablo Escobar idea or the Narcos movies and all those, you know, uh, narratives of huge criminal organization and real enterprises with franchises everywhere, now you have a loose, you know, network of different organizations. If you want to get some money, then you record to extortion because that is easier. If you have, you know, a route for premium, for tra trafficking drugs, then you start, you know, also trafficking um, uh, cigarrillos, um, tobacco, you know, which is a huge market. Um, there is gold from Colombia and Peru. Peru, there is a couple of papers that show that in Peru, illegal mining brings more money than drug trafficking. So illegal mining is huge and it's not e really easy to get, you know, gold out of some places and move it to the to the to Europe which is the final destination. The whole concept of illegal markets is so um, dispersed that there is a lot of evidence of, you know, illegal market of exotic uh, birds from the Amazon region. that are, you know, flown to, the, to Africa and then to Europe again. So um, what is very important to see is that there is this, this uh, supposed this uh, general perception that we have an underground uh, illegal economy is not longer an underground focus illegal economy. It's, you know, I think this is you know this is an over, over the top economy that has some shades in some areas. You don't know who is the one who are, you know, who, who are buying all those, you know, buildings in some countries, who are the investors in some of the universities in some other countries. Well, in most cases, illegal money. 
coming that is related to this illegal market. So it's not, I just, just want to finish saying, it's not that we have one czar of the drug trafficking and we have to find him and the whole thing will, you know, uh, be peaceful. It's not that we have to find the one or two in Ecuador. It's not that if we find Pito, the whole thing, you know, moves peacefully. In fact, we have thousands of small groups moving in a very, you know, complex network. And if you die, you have thousands of others who will take your place. That's the whole, you know, the complexity of the situation that we are facing now. Thanks, Lucia. Uh, Renato. Um, actually, from my point of view, I mean, from a geopolit geopolitical context, um, I think that in Latin America, criminal organizations see territorial control as an important factor for, for criminal activities. I mean, if you control border for, for borders, for example, you move drugs, but also you can, uh, you can uh, exploit illegal, illegal mining activities. So for my point of view, um, territorial control is key. I'm, I'm, I agree with Lucia saying that criminal organizations tend to specialize their activities uh, from the 80s, I think, to, to this time. But territorial control is key for moving uh, these illicit markets. So I'm, I'm, I don't know. I mean, it, it depends, I think, from what is happening in, in some, uh, some countries like Ecuador, Peru, uh, Bolivia, Central America, where territorial control is key to comparing to other markets or other countries such as the US or Europe where organizations are loose or, and flexible because they don't need to control uh, territories to, to be uh, profitable. So I think it's, it's an in, in very interesting discussion. I think so what is the future of violence? That's why from my, from my point of view, violence is uh, it's very important to regulate these markets. And that's why you need this territorial control. So I think it depends on the on the context on where you're standing. Well, it sounds like we have the topic for our next uh, discussion as well at some point in the future. Um, and it looks like at this point, we are pretty much done. Um, I want to thank both Lucia and Renato for an amazing, absolutely amazing panel here today. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, your knowledge, your expertise with us today. I thank all of the audience members. It was wonderful to see all the wonderful questions, people from Ecuador, from the United States and other places asking a lot of questions. Um, and it was great to have you all here. Uh, Vicky, any closing words for us? Uh, thanks to you, Eduardo. You did a great job managing the panel and putting the panel together. It has been a pleasure. And thanks to everyone as well, the panelists and the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much for all of you. Ciao, Renato. Ciao, Eduardo. Ciao, Vicky. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you all. Take care, everybody.